The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. First Century Investors Believe actively targeting Australia's growth engine. High quality growing companies listed on the ASX is the secret to beating the market. Since 1993, every wholesale fund managed by its Australian equities growth team has outperformed the share market over the long term. They believe high quality growing companies can power tax effective, geared, X20 and concentrated portfolios. Thinking about new ways to target Australian share market growth Think first, send your investors. Past performance not indicative of future performance. Net of fees as at August 2024. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I have Shannon Freeney from Fox and Hair with me today. Shannon, thank you for, for joining me today or this afternoon to, uh, to record the podcast. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure, James. Thank you for inviting me. And I must say, uh, firstly, thanks for, for doing this at somewhat short notice. I had, uh, I had someone else scheduled for this afternoon. They've rescheduled to to next week so I needed to find someone to to fill the slot you responded to my message on LinkedIn and and here we are um it was something that stood out to me and I'm interested in, in your take on it, the the power of branding like you, you sent me a message saying no, I'm free whatever I would love to have a chat I went to your profile and your your LinkedIn profile you're wearing a t-shirt with the fox and hair logo mm-hmm. on it and before I even saw that you worked at fox and hair I saw the logo and I'm like Oh, that's fox and hair, and then you look at like the little the banner thing that's at the top. The branding's so powerful. I don't know if it's just me because I'm kind of in the industry and I see you know there's there's a few of your fox and hair these days, and you're all posting stuff online and you kind of see some of it. But I don't know, it was powerful for for me. So kudos to whoever's behind that because I recognised that you worked at fox and hair before I even read that you worked at fox and hair anywhere. Absolutely. Look, I have to give it. Massive shout out to Liam, our marketing manager. He does a phenomenal job. Uh, I think the logo he's told me is called the Twin Tails. Um, we we're just talking the other day at our quarterly business meeting where we we're talking about I'd love to see the Twin Tails on a building someday because it is such a powerful, noticeable uh, symbol. And yeah, it was something before I even started a fox and hair. It was something I could recognize off the bat. So massive kudos to Liam and just everyone at Fox and Hair who's managed to create such a powerful brand. Uh, mm-hmm. I really love my brand in that respect. Do you have a bit of freedom around like the look? I'm on your LinkedIn profile now, and for anyone that's and obviously this is a this is an audio format. The the, the podcast have jump on Shannon's LinkedIn profile afterwards, but but at the top there's that there's a little picture, and it's a group of people on the beach, and then there's the fox and hare logo in the in the in the back on the, on the corner. I had Trish Gregory on the podcast a, a, a while back, and she's got a it's a different picture, but with the same logo. Like, do you have any freedom over? Does does that picture of a group of people on the beach mean anything to you or does someone choose that for you uh so again that was passed on to me by liam uh in marketing and yeah i think what we're after there is a real cohesion in the branding it really shows who we are as a company as what we're looking to um you know support the sort of community that we're interested in i think he does a marvelous job at keeping consistent and cohesive around that so yeah at their say if i wanted the freedom i'd uh, be able to jump at it but i think liam does a fantastic job why why change what works? Yeah, and look, they're all different, you know, all, all different, you know, slightly different pictures and uh, as I said, you know, you, yours is the beach, Trish is something else, but you've got got the little logo there, which is which is great. Now you're you're pretty new to Fox and Hair. We were just briefly chatting before we press record, but you you've only joined in, in the last few months. Correct. So I'm just in my third or fourth month now. It feels like forever at this point. Um I feel like I'm part of a third show already. No, I've been in executive management roles for uh, quite a few years before joining Fox and Hair. I just got the itch to get back into client facing after being on the sidelines for so long, um, yeah. taking care of compliance and being a head of advice and being a general manager. It uh, starts to take a different toll than being an advisor is. So Fox and Hair really 
ticked all the boxes as far as the sort of advice I wanted to give, the demographic, uh, being progressive. Uh, it was really a full package, so I was really, really proud to join the ranks. Yeah. Well, what's that? What's that recruitment process like? Is it a is it a quick turnaround? Is it is it you get do you get to know Glenn and others and you know, the, the the team over an extended period of time? How, what's what's it look like? Yeah, so it did take a little while to move. Um, I was fortunate enough that I needed a good long holiday, so I was very uh, privileged to take my time and really look for the right firm to um, plant my feet under a desk. Yep. So initially started with me reaching out to Glenn quite a few months beforehand just to yep. assess what we're looking at. Um, you know, being such a well-known firm and having such a great reputation, obviously one of the first places I wanted to reach out to. I uh, ended up flying down to Sydney to meet Glenn and the head of vice, uh, Courtney just to meet them in person, make sure I was making the right decision and give them a bit of confidence as well. Um, yeah. So the process itself, I think, took maybe a month, maybe two months um, towards it, but it didn't really feel like it was arduous or anything of the sort. I've been through some very long interview processes before. It felt like uh, you know, it was taking forever, but because I was due for a holiday anyway, I think it's uh, really just aligned. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, now you're... You're not in Sydney, so 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 Fox and Hess are hundred percent remote these days, aren't they? Is is that Correct. how it works? Yeah. So where are you, where where are you? Like where am I talking to you from? Where are you now? Uh, I'm located in sunny Brisbane, so yeah. I'm not saying today. I think we're having some storms, but <laughs> yeah, I think we're all across Australia now. We've got some associates starting who are so in South Australia and Victoria. We have our monthly office day in Sydney where we all get together and stay cohesive and you know do some activities together. But I think we're yeah fairly well across all the states now. Yeah, yeah. So, so how does that? So, how does that work? What once a once a month you all fly to Sydney? Like, do you stay overnight, or do you get there early in the morning and then leave in the afternoon? What's the What's the setup like? I think it just depends on personal preference. I like to maximise my time there. Uh, yeah. Any excuse to get to Sydney and you know get around the city, I'm happy to take. Yeah, um, I think it's good to be around people as long as you can be and try to get that face to face time up. Especially when you work from home, it can be very easy to get isolated and. Um, you know, stay in your pajamas all day while you're grinding our phone notes. Yeah, yeah. So you, so what you you get to Sydney kind of the day before or something? Do you? like if if the all staff day is on Wednesday or whatever, you go on a Tuesday or something, and you're there from the morning. Generally, yeah, yeah. I'd try to get down and get sleep sleeping pattern in order, so I'm making the most of the times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. And how do you? What I guess what's what's your take on on what other businesses are doing? Because I I get this sense of we're we're in, we're in this environment now where where some businesses are going 100% remote and they're just getting rid of the office and doing something to keep everyone together. Fox and Hare's version of it is everyone gets together once a month in, in Sydney. Or, or you've got people going the other way where they're saying, no, we want people in the office regularly, three, four, five days a week, and the remote thing doesn't work. And if you can't come, if you can't commit to coming to the office that often, well, this isn't the place to work for you and See you later. Do, do, do you have a sense of what's going on out there? I think seeing what I've seen just in past jobs and sort of getting around the industry, a lot of places are trying to mandate some days back in the office for yeah. whether it be for culture, uh, efficiency, process, whatever it might look like. I do appreciate the ability to have the flexibility of work from home because, as you're probably aware, a lot of um, our members are going to be employed to some degree. So the nine to five generally isn't the best time to try and catch them for an hour, an hour, an hour and a half. So being able to schedule a before work or an after work meeting allows that flexibility around that. Although I do see the benefit of having someone next to you while you're working, you can share knowledge, you can share ideas, you can help build a stronger culture with that regard. Uh, one thing I love about Fox and Hair is that we have a daily catch up, whether it's on Teams. Uh, if you've got a meeting, that's fine, you can miss it, but it does allow us at the end of the day to have a catch up, have a joke, um, still build that cohesion. And then when we do catch up uh, in our monthly office day, it's not like we're strangers of being away for a month at a time. So that's ev- everyone every day you get together for how long? 10 minutes, half an hour? What's it? Yeah, just a quick 15 minute catch up. So at the end of the day, uh, okay. whether it's whether you can make it or not, as we know, you know, member meetings and uh, video meetings and whatnot come into it. Um, yep. All of our staff have kids. So if we have to duck off to pick them up, then that's totally fine as well. Yeah, okay. And do you, are you doing any? Meetings in person, like are any are any of the clients that you're working with in Brisbane that you're seeing seeing them face to face, or you're doing everything online? Look, primarily it's online. I've offered uh, anyone who's local. I've offered to do a face to face. I've traditionally been a face to face planner, um, yeah. you know, early in my career. So part of me loves the you know the interaction and building that 
face-to-face rapport. Um, but by and large, a lot of people either don't have the time or they're pretty happy just to jump on a Teams call. I think moving forward, as we're doing more member events where they can come in person to a dinner and hear a seminar or what that might look like, I think that does build that rapport outside of that as well. Yeah. Uh, but I'm very open to meeting people face-to-face, whether it's Teams or um, going having a coffee or booking at a an office for the day uh, in the CBD to try and get some people through there. Yeah, okay. I noticed you had a – I saw online that – there was you had a member event maybe last week or something. Mm. Uh, was that was that in Sydney? Was it? I, I, it was. So, yeah. Yeah. Did you go down for that? Or had it or, or not? No. Unfortunately, no. the the gears were in works for that um, before I could um, reorganise timing. So yeah. I was down a few days before, but I couldn't stretch the trip out just for yeah. family reasons. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was a sold out event. We had a waiting list of I think it was thirty plus people who were trying to come. Um, yeah. But you know. We were obviously at max capacity, so that was really encouraging to see. Yeah, so that would that be part of the, the the plans moving forward, part of your engagement with with the members? Absolutely, I think this yeah. one was such a great success. Uh, again, another shout out to Liam, um, did an mm. amazing job setting up, and all the team who were there um, really loved it and really loved engaging. So, mm. hopefully, some more events up in the Brisbane area would be great. Try and <laughs> uh, get me there and get a few of our local members in the place. Yeah, I suppose that's part of what you. You know, I, I think a lot of financial advice businesses these days have got clients all over Australia. You know, it, it used to be your 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 office was somewhere or other, and you had a network of clients somewhat nearby to your office. But now, with Teams as, as we're chatting and everything else, clients are all over the place. So, yeah, if you're going to do events, it's you almost need to do them in Brisbane and then in Sydney and in Melbourne and Adelaide or or, or wherever, so that you can capture all of the means together. Spend a bit of time on a plane, though, if you're bouncing around to those different events. Absolutely. I think the post-COVID world, it's um, travel's not a, a stranger to me, but also it is great to just get in front of the you know the people that we're helping along a financial journey is really important. Being able to meet them face-to-face and check the hand at least once, I think, is a really good uh, way to build that trust and you know really cement that relationship. Yeah. Now, what's the structure like for you that you've you've recently joined a, a, new, a new business in Fox & Hare? Uh, it's 100 percent remote. Like, how how do you learn to do the job that you're doing? You you said before about being authorized, and we'll get into that in a second. Like, how how do you, how do you learn what you need to do to do your job properly when you don't have someone that you can just spend all day sitting next to to shadow them? How do you, how do you structure it? Really good question. Um, I think the benefit that I've had is I've got you know over a decade of experience in the industry as an advisor. And also supervising staff and supervising advisors. So I have an understanding of how that learning process needs to unpack. But uh, Courtney, our head of advice, does an amazing job. She's there within minutes of, you know, shooting a team's message or an email. Um, the team itself is just full of support. Christine and Trish, uh, two other advisors, do an amazing job of just providing that even just intrinsic support or just someone to ask a bounce a quick question off. Um, the systems that we've got are very slick as well. They have an amazing job done beforehand, it's great to actually join a firm that understood what it's like to build efficiencies. So even just coming into it, it was very much relying on muscular as an advisor, being able to talk to members. But also when the systems are set up and the workflows are mapped out and documented properly, it, it actually becomes very seamless. I can just jump into SharePoint and find a manual on how to complete a task, which I think a lot of firms are starting to starting to clue onto about is really important, in, in, especially in this remote world. Yeah. So, so you've got a so you're coming to a new role, knowing broadly what you need to do, but then kind of searching for an, a, a manual that says, okay, if I'm, I don't know, to prepare my pack of documents or whatever you might prepare going into a review meeting, member meeting, whatever you call it, and there's some process guide that you can just follow to get everything that you need to, to go into that meeting. Is that is that how it works? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, there is that, but also the support from our support staff is unreal as well. Um, there's very little manual admin work, I'd call it, um, to prepare for a lot of meetings. A lot of it is done in the background where I can just see who I've got on tomorrow, give their file a good research, make sure I know um, who I'm working with, you know, what their pain points are. And a lot of the work is already ready for me just to, you know, it's like a blank canvas, like just come in and paint. I don't need to set everything up for myself. Yeah. And so someone like the admin support team what whatever the setup is, is is like that are they like how do they know there's a meeting tomorrow are they checking your diary is that is that through a thread in x plan like how do how do they know you're meeting with someone tomorrow to then prepare things for 
Yeah, good question. Um, it took me a little while to figure this out, actually. Um, our CRM is just very slick, using a couple of different programs like your HubSpots and whatnot to mm-hmm. just communicate amongst the team whose workflow is sitting where. Our members got very uh, stringent workflows that you know, step-by-step of what to do to, in order to bring them to the next step of the process. Who steps in at this point? Who takes care of this? Who takes care of this task? And very clear instructions on what's to come next. So I can leave instructions with a file note for someone to pick up a task and someone else to pick up another task. Uh, it runs very seamlessly. It's, it's very, um, it's kind of like the system I wish I, I could, I had built at uh, previous firms and someone's actually come and done it. So it's nice to see it actually can work. I, I've spoken to, I, I've spoken to others on the podcast about and, and like some of the things that you're saying. Like I'd, I'd love to spend, like I'd love to spend a month in the business to, to work, like see how it all works. Cause that's, it's one thing to, to talk to people about it, but then it's another thing to actually be in there, learning it and, and doing it like you are, because you know we're we're going through the whole kind of X plan thread thing and trying to automate bits and pieces there. But as you've just said, Fox and Aaron, I know other businesses are using all of these other tools to to do their version of the same same thing. It'd be amazing to go in as and go into different businesses, but we can't really do that. It doesn't really work that way. Never mind. So. The, the the members that you the members that you're working with now are they already members of Fox and Hare? Are they new clients? So what, who who are you talking to? Um, so I'm in a really fortunate position where I've got a blank uh, book of clients to just grow. So we have okay. a phenomenal amount of uh, inbound leads who we already reach out to to ensure that we're the right fit for them, uh, making sure that they they understand this is a this is quite a journey to go on. Uh, we want them to be excited about it. So by the time they're booked in the calendar. They already know what to expect. Uh, they understand what's coming. Um, so when we're talking to yeah, the members here, it's not so much about trying to sell them on a financial plan. It's about, I want to understand what this journey is going to look like, and I want you to yeah. be as excited as I am to go on this. Yeah. Uh, so it's very, I would say it's a little bit different to the traditional model where someone comes in not really knowing what, what to expect and being told that, no, I'm not going to give you advice today. I'm going to go away and give you a document. And here's the advice we're going to give. Uh, yeah. They already know this. They already know what the journey is going to look like. Um, so it's more about actually understanding what are we really trying to achieve, how are we going to achieve it. Yeah. And a document at the end is more of a formality because we've just gone on such a detailed journey with them already. Yeah. And who's who's doing all that pre work, that whole education bit that you're referring to before you're before you're going to the meeting with them? How's that being done? Is is that you talking to them? Is that someone else? Is it? videos what's, what's that? so we have uh an amazing bloke called will um who effectively screens everyone who puts an inquiry in oh, so you cool. have a 45 minute coffee chat with uh anyone who sort of meets the criteria of someone who wants to go on this journey um so he's definitely got his work cut out for him but he's incredible understands how to pitch this journey understands how to convey he, here's what is actually going to happen with this if is this the right journey for you um, he's never about just trying to put something to the door so we can write a plan. He's definitely really? about trying to find, are you the right fit? Are you the right fit for Shannon as well? Um, is he the right advisor for you? Or are we looking at perhaps finding another advisor who might suit you better? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of freedom in that regard. And uh, Will does a phenomenal job of basically assessing, uh, are they the right fit for Fox and Hare? Are they the right fit for me as an advisor? Um, you know, and, and explaining this is the journey that you're going to go on. It's time to get excited. And if they are excited and they do get to the stage of booking in, uh, it's a very it, it's a great first meeting with the advisor because we're really starting to talk about you know what's important to you, what are your actual goals, not just your financial goals. Um, by the time we get to that same advice, like I said, it's a formality at that point because they're already they're engaged, they know what's coming. Yeah, and so there's so before Will meets with them, is it there's some type of screening that happens before even that step? Uh, just like a an online form, from my understanding. So oh, yeah. they'll go in and just put their details in and. It gives us an understanding of whether, you know, is it the high school student who just got their first job? Probably not the ideal financial planning client. We could look at yeah. perhaps giving them an education program instead. Or are they a retiree who is going to be fully reliant on the, on the age pension? It's probably not the demographic that we're best suited to yeah. handle. Um, yeah. Are we better off referring you to someone who's more suited for that? Which are, and who is the who is a typical Fox and Hair client? What does that what does that look like? Uh, I think the term it was in the AFR that um, Glenn Hare coin an article to Henry is the high owner is not rich yet. Yeah. So I think the average age of our member is 34. So yes. drastically younger than the average financial planning client. Uh, primarily younger members who are quite driven, have reasonable incomes, but just aren't really sure what to do next. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's a oh, it's a brush of fresh air f- uh, from the institutional client who might come to you with a problem and needs to solve that. It's really a blank slate of someone who just doesn't have the know-how or can't cut through the noise or just doesn't have the time perhaps to really implement these changes and you know get themselves ahead. Yeah, I've often I've often described that that type of client as this these they kind of coming to you saying what do we do next? Like what what next? You know, I've done this and my career's all right and I've got a house or I've got family or whatnot. But but what next? You know, we don't we don't, we don't know what to do next and you well and truly playing in that in that space. Is is there a is there a client that's that's too old for Fox and Hair where you would say no we need we don't play in that space and refer them on somehow? To be honest, I haven't come across too many. Uh, yeah. I've got some who are sort of entering the early fifties who still fit the bill of that high end or not rich yet, who just maybe haven't had the high income for a long enough time, or they've been set back by something. I mean, I, I think we're primarily geared toward that market of the you know the demographic of a bit younger who still has a long runway to retirement. We're not focusing on trying to optimize their assets for the age pension. We're trying to optimize their assets so they don't need the age pension, mm-hmm. uh, get into retire before they can even access their super. I think there are people out there who do a phenomenal job of dealing with pre-retirees and working with you know retirees in that space. I think we're probably best best off you know, playing with two of our strengths and helping the people with those strengths. But as you know, yeah, the average person has approximately one birthday every twelve months, so our members do get older. Um, I think we'll get to the point where our members have been with us for so long, and hopefully they love what we've done. Uh, they will become pre-retirees and retirees. Yeah, it's interesting to 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 talk about that. I there was someone on the podcast I had a, a little while ago that that similar to Vox and Hair is kind of playing in that younger demographic from a traditional financial planning business for for sure. And I pose the question to them: Do you think that the demographic of clients that you work with will will age up as you, the advisor, a- ages up as well? You know, and you, I don't know how old you are, but but you know, you don't look like you're 55 years old, and 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 those that I know that work at Fox and here, they don't look like they're 55 years old either. So mm. the advisors are younger, the staff is younger, the clients are younger. You're all in that kind of that that age bracket, and and potentially. All, all grow older together, the clients and the staff all at the same time. Absolutely. I think a challenge that some younger advisors have had is giving retirees advice on how to retire when they're still 30 or uh, 20 or 30 years. 20, old. 25. I've just finished junior and I've done my professional <laughs> year. I'm 25 years old. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I got it early on in my career. I uh, I went to go and meet a client at reception and they um, the I, when I met them and said, hi, I'm James and kind of took them into the meeting room that we were going into. She's like, hang on, you're James, you're the advisor. I thought you were just the person greeting me. And James is going to be this <laughs> older person walking in. It was a while, a while back that, uh, that, that that happened. Now, some of your some of your earlier jobs, so you've been a fox in here for a, for a, for a few months now. Uh, something that stood out to me on your, um, on your LinkedIn, and, and, I, and I'm kind of keen to, 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 to see more about it, uh, at a previous firm where you were working, you, there's a comment here to say you you oversaw the delivery of digit, digitized financial advice to over eighteen and a half thousand clients on ongoing service arrangements. Can you elaborate a bit on what on what that's about and how you did it? Like, you know, there's always been this chat of you know robo advice or digital advice, and how do you do that at scale and low cost for a whole lot of people? What we what were you doing in that role? Honestly, I look back at that and I wonder how how we managed to pull it off. Um, to be honest. I think the starting a firm that relied primarily on phone and um, digital advice pre-COVID was the biggest stroke of luck that any firm could have come across. Um, People were suddenly very aware of their superannuation and their finances and having someone they could still reach out to while their traditional financial planner couldn't even go to their office. Uh, I think that really kick-started the growth of that firm. Yeah, Uh, It was primarily around scoping the advice to what's an everyday Australian would would need. And when I say everyday Australian, I don't mean the everyday Australian a financial planner normally refers to, which is someone with a million dollars to invest. Um, I mean, the everyday Australian who doesn't have much left over after their paycheck, who is happy speaking to an advisor over the phone, who just needs a bit of cash flow support, just needs to consolidate their super, just needs enough insurance that they're not going to be set back by being off work. Where they're not they're not chasing trying to invest a debt recycle or you know even potentially purchase a home. They need to get the basics in order. So it's a very low cost, um, very I don't want to call it low touch, but also a almost sort of a 
a setup and then let's touch base again in six months, let's touch base again in six months. The plans weren't overly complex because the demographic didn't need overly complex high touch bots. Yeah. So that allowed a, a quite a large book to be supported by only about 40 advisors in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And so was that was that built from scratch? Were you involved there building it from scratch or what, ha- what happened? Yeah, so I came in very early on. Uh, yeah. So I started off as senior advisor there, uh, really just trying to bring on these clients and understanding, you know, what is the demographic? What is the need here? What are we really trying to achieve? Um, I made my way up to financial planning manager, then head of advice, and also was the responsible manager of the license as well. Yeah. Uh, got to do some amazing things sitting on the investment committee and compliance committee. Um, definitely grew some great hairs well ahead of when I um, should have. <laughs> I think I can see this as an advisor, but advisors aren't easy to manage. Um, yeah. Having 40 of them under me, who a lot of whom were older, um, it definitely made it uh, an interesting experience. But that book itself and that business itself, I think definitely catered toward that demographic of Australians who just needed the, a, a bit of a push in the right direction. Yeah. It wasn't complex, but it was enough to get them to where they need to be. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And was that, that that team of the 40 advisors, was that all scattered all over Australia as well? It wasn't 40 advisors heading all into one office? Uh, they were primarily were in Queensland with probably about a third of the team remote. Uh, across yeah, right. uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, that's that that that's big. And what what else have you been up to? What did you, what were you doing before, prior to Fox and Hair? Uh, so I had a short stint um, helping a accounting firm set up their AFSL. So I was part of a global uh, accounting firm who just really wanted to add another layer of uh, support to their clients. Yeah. Um, so that went quite well. It definitely wasn't the advice I wanted to do long term. So I came in and. Set the foundation and set the structure there. And when it came to about a six month mark, where I was decided if I want to stay on and grow the book as an advisor or you know, take that holiday that I've been desperately after, uh, I decided to go for the holiday. Yeah. How long did you take off in between? Uh, just about close to three months in the end of it. Nice. Yeah. I just came back from a week's holiday and I'm, I'm like, oh, I was, I was in Byron Bay and I'm like, oh, I like this idea of just earning enough money to get by and just, just to live and doing this, you know. This uh, this much more chilled life than uh, than what it seems to be working in working in financial advice. So, what was it that, that made you want to get back into the kind of jump the fence back into the financial advice advising side of things rather than that more maybe corporate side where you, where you were before? I mean, the biggest reason is that I just missed it. I think mm. sitting over advisors and watching them deliver advice and coaching them just wasn't quite the same. I think after being on the sidelines for the better part of three years, I hadn't. I was, I, was, I was learning a lot, but I wasn't able to deploy it at, you know, speaking to clients or speaking to people. Um, I'd have the occasional meeting where I'd sit in on and, you know, probably take over to the dismay of the advisor who's trying to run the session. Um, but I realized that this is a career that I had done very well in uh, previously and I really enjoyed. And obviously took the uh, leap into management because, I mean, a high pay is always nice and something different, um, looks good in the resume. And then when I, in my last role where I was sort of developing and seeing clients and sort of doing a blend of both, it really kick-started that I really wanted to get back in front of, you know, the people I wanted to support. Yep. Um, now, Fox and Hair having such a great reputation and also helping the demographic that I really wanted to work with, uh, that really ticked the box. So I explored a few other roles and they just weren't really matching up to Fox and Hair. So I was seeing how I really hoping that I'd get the call eventually. <laughs> um, <laughs> and thankfully it came through. Sounds like it did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, did you have any like you know with with being out of advice for for a little while, a little bit later, being out of an advisor rather than just being out of advice? Did you have any issues with like professional year and licensing or anything like that? Did that cause any headaches for you when you when you wanted to be, come back, or, or did you have an authorized rep status the whole way through? Uh, I remained authorized the whole way, so ah, okay. There's no intention for me to ever become um, deauthorized. So I always wanted to complete my master in financial planning anyway, because I think it's always good to be educated in the field that you're in. Um, yeah. I've got a suite, I've got an eye-watering hex there for the suite of other degrees that I've done as well. So I was always learning whilst I was on top of that. So that was never going to be uh, a problem for me. I think it was also good not being on the forefront because I got to learn from an objective point of uh, view as well. Um, so I found that really interesting to explore other ways other people are giving advice and how they're delivering advice and why they're delivering advice as well. That was really interesting to see from an outside point of view and then come back to the advice, you know, the client-facing world and be able to implement some of the things that I liked. Did, were, you, were you doing your master's whilst you were in this kind of editor advice type role? 
Yeah, correct. Your word. Okay. How long did the Masters take you? Um, so I'm just finishing off now. I oh. decided to try and do a Master of Financial Planning and a Master of Applied Finance at two different unis at the same time. So I was doing one subject at a time. So I do one subject here, one subject there, and uh, return to the other one. Um, I feel like I've learned quite a lot. I'm in doing that, but I'm very ready to be finished with studying for the time being. The one thing you've got eye watering hex, dead. You got two <laughs> two masters going on, so it's not it's not the Kaplan one you're doing. What what, what unis are you at? Um, so I'm at UNSW for the Master of Applied Finance. Yeah. Um, dude, it's got a, such a great reputation of that degree. Mm. Um, I decided to go to Victoria Uni for the Master of Financial Planning. Um, yeah. I felt well, Kaplan's a great. Um, you know, education piece. I wanted to learn something a little bit different to what I'd done my diploma and my advanced diploma and my diploma of mortgage broking and whatnot. It felt like I just needed something a bit fresher and different for that. Yeah. Did you have to do the masters for like licensing requirements or you just did it because you want to? Just because I want to. So I was going to say it sounds like you've done them both just because you want to. You're one of those crazy people. Good on you. Well done. So what? So what's next for you? What's uh, where? Where do you? What's on the cards? You know, you've obviously just recently started at Fox and Hair, but but what what's your twelve months? You know, three months, uh, three years, five years. What do you want to do? Great question. Something I ask clients, uh, ask members every day, but uh, I probably couldn't answer myself. I think I'm really enjoying Fox and Hair and the process and getting back in front of members now. Um, I'm in a great position where I just get to bring on the members who I think I can work very well with and the ones who are really excited about this journey. And I can't stress enough how refreshing that is um, compared to in previous roles I've kind of had to take on business because you need to generate that revenue. Um, mm-hmm. This is a, a very unique, um, fantastic position to be in. So I definitely for the next 12 months just sort of head down, finish the finish both the masters, um, get the book uh, working, and then probably just reassess whether, you know, do I want to branch out and do some more education and learn something a bit different or mm-hmm. am I happy just being a, a very good advisor and what I'm doing. Um, mm. Definitely getting into the industry more. So you know, thank you very much for inviting me on today. Um, <laughs> more events like this, just getting getting out there and doing some more learning um, in this respect as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the next priority for the next 12 months, I think. What do you – so you, you know, you're effectively starting from from zero. How many – like how many new members would you would be starting the process with you each – I don't know, month or so or something. You know, those, those that you meet with and you both agree, okay, we're going to keep keep going with this process. What what type of numbers are you talking? Well, I get to give myself a little pat on the back. So we, when I first started, we had a internal challenge of Fox and Hair to if we could bring on twenty members in a month, uh, we would set up a in a month. Mm. We'd set up a scholarship for uh, one of the orphanages that we sponsor, the SOS Village in Cebu, in the Philippines, um, to. Yeah, I start sending some people to school and university. Yeah. Um, so obviously because I am who I am, I decided I had to take that business goal on as a personal goal. Um, so decided that I had to not just get 20, but I had to get more than 20 my first month of giving advice, and I'm actually a cheater. So very happy with that. But it was a team effort, obviously. The yeah. team really supported me in that. Uh, but I think at the moment, if we're sitting at you know, hitting my sort of three-month mark, um, I think I might have just actually signed member number 40 uh, earlier today. Okay. So. And is there a is there a limit to like how many you can have? Like what like with the systems and processes you've got you got in place? We've got some goals um, set, but I think at the moment it'll be very much trying to navigate. Well, especially for myself, getting a, a handle on my capacity. Um, I've managed very big books before, however, they've been slightly different in the level of touch, level of attention that we provide to them. Mm. So I think probably once we hit the we will talk about the magic Dunbar number of 150 clients per advisor. I think as we start nearing that, there'll be some assessment on capacity and establish, is this enough? Am I able to bring on more? Am I happy with you know the level of attention I'm giving my existing members? Okay. It's very much about, I want to promise a member that they're going to be with me along a journey. However, they can't get a hold of me for three days in a row because I'm too busy helping other people on their journey. So there's always a fine balancing act, which it's I think tough, every single it? goes through. It's a tough, it's a tough part that everyone... That everyone goes. Do you like? Do you so in, in terms of support staff and what whatever that looks like? At, as you grow, do you have like a dedicated associate advisor in that kind of traditional sense that a lot of other financial advice businesses have, or or, or do you just operate as an advisor and then you're just supported by the team of support staff, whatever that whatever that looks like? 
Um, so we do have a dedicated support staff team. So we've got implementation and para planners and um, yeah, a member concierge who reach out to mass after process. Um, just for up. you, just for you, or or do, the, or do those people play that same role for other advisors too? So that's a pool team at the yeah. moment. Uh, we are looking at bringing on advisors for each, uh, bring on associate advisors for each advisor. Uh, okay. uh, got a very eager um, gentleman starting with me in a few weeks' time. I'm sure he'll be. I'm very excited to bring on board and mentor him. Um, oh, to be your associate advisor. Correct. Yeah. Oh, great. So, yeah, yeah. I know he's quite excited as well. I'm sure he'll love to hear this as a shout out. But yeah, I think the, the support that we have is phenomenal and that will only continue to grow as we get, you know, the systems are more efficient. Um, you know, we can handle more members coming on board. Having the pool team is very handy because that the skills they get to be spread. Uh, yes. But also, I've not seen in previous roles where people can get siloed into just working with one advisor and knowing how to interpret what they do. And then they don't really have a transferable well, as many transferable skills, they have to stand in for someone else. So I think there's a fine balancing act with that that needs to be achieved. Yeah, yeah. Well, Shannon, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, as I said right at the start, I appreciate you doing this at somewhat short notice, but it sounds like maybe it's a bit of a goal of yours to to get out in the industry a little bit more. So maybe this is the first thing and you'll have to come come down to Sydney. Well, I'm, I'm in Melbourne. I'll have to go up to Sydney. You'll have to come down to Sydney for the ensemble PD day that's coming up in November at some point. So it'd be good to good to have you along if you if you can make it to Sydney or tee up one of your in person days for, for when uh when when that's happening. Absolutely. I'll be looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. thank you very much for bringing me on. Enjoy it. Thanks, Shannon.